This is Digital Music Trends, episode 124, produced on the 22nd of March and recorded between the 10th and the 18th of March uh, 2013 at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. This week on the show, a bird's eye view on DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2013 with extracts from uh, interviews with a number of digital music experts and digital music companies, including 7 Digital, Livestream, Sound Exchange, Jumplify, 1RPM, CD Baby, Sperry Media, Songza, SoundCloud, MediaNet, Lyric Find, Give It and many more. We're going to look at some of the main topics of discussion in Austin and I really hope I've put together a coherent show for you. Of course, bear in mind that these extracts are all part of a broader conversation and you can find the full interviews on DMT's YouTube or SoundCloud's channels if you want to delve in deeper. Also, if you want to take a look at some of the places and bands that I checked out during South by Southwest, you can head to the Tumblr I was running there, which is uh, on digitalmusictrends.tumblr.com, and you'll get a bit of a feel as to what I was up to in Austin. So first of all, uh, on this South by Southwest special, a look at how companies deal with international expansion and issues that come with that. Digital music services are announcing the expansion into new territories every other day, it seems, so that's a pretty important area of growth. And let's start with the point of view of Vicky Noman, president of North America for 7Digital. Okay, so uh, let's talk about, let's start by talking about uh, sort of the in- expansion of 7Digital. Of course, uh, it's a company that, you know, coming from London, I'm very familiar with, uh, but uh, you're really, you know, making waves in in terms of uh, expanding the service into into more territories. So, uh, first of all, how many how many ter- territories are you on right now? We currently have rights in 40 countries, and um, and we're constantly we're constantly monitoring everything for you know smartphone uptake, the you know the connectivity rate, and we have a lot of big partners in the consumer electronics space that often drive our expansion into new markets. But Latin America is a really high priority for us this year. Yeah. And of course, it's not just a question of um, getting you know the catalog that you already have to those markets. It's also a question of licensing their catalog for, for your service. So that's where it really starts to get tricky because uh, I've had some dealings with you know having to deal with songwriters from Mexico and having to call their collection society and it was it was pretty hard to do. So do you guys have people on the ground that do that? Well, we we're we're somewhat masochists in this because it, it's so difficult because in each territory, every time you want to expand internationally, you have. Uh, the labels, you have the publishers, there's usually some sort of collection society representing the publishers, so you have to do direct deals with all of them. And then, in addition to that, there's usually really important market forces at play. So, is it carriers? Is it, you know, who are the gating items? What kind of devices do people use? Do they have connectivity in their homes or is it in the workplace? What, you know, and if we're, if you're trying to license a la carte downloads, but the market, the price of a download is equal to dinner for a family of four for a week, then it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. So we have to look at all of those factors and figure out what the right model is, when the time is right to go into it, and ways to have enough local connections on the ground to get the right catalog, the locally relevant catalog, and build the relationships. Yeah, sure. And is it, it must be quite interesting to actually look at those markets and find out about services like, for example, I read about the service called Savn in India uh, that kind of is a substitute for Spotify and uh, something that I hadn't really heard of before. So uh, did you find like, and, and um, I was uh, talking to people in Morocco and there's uh, a few startups that work in new space over there. So there's always startups that we don't really know about coming, you know, being focused on UK and US mostly. And were you surprised by the number of startups that work in music in, in different territories? It, yes, it never ceases to amaze us. And we start getting inquiries. You know, we've, getting a, we've been getting a lot of inquiries from India and um, you know, and companies companies start innovating, and they start seeing little glimpses of success, and then they they reach out to us, and that's one of the ways that we monitor it. But it's, you know, there's you know, not not a day goes by that someone from some part of the world is pitching some use of the catalog that we haven't thought of. Yeah. So it definitely keeps us on our toes. And as a follow up, here's the perspective of Lyric Finds CEO Daryl Ballantyne. And uh, I was talking to uh, to Vicky actually from Sun Digital yesterday about uh, the same issue of international expansion for for a company like yours, uh, and especially when it comes to lyrics. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's even more even more complicated than when it comes to to just pure music. Uh, how do you deal with uh, you know working with uh, uh, publishers around the world? Do you have people on the ground, or, or how do you work on that front? Yeah, Vicky and I, I think, have, uh, we have a support group for international expansion that we go to, <laughs> um, and it's. 
uh, publishing worldwide is 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 a bit of a mess. Uh, our our main targets there are working with with societies in each country uh, to do aggregate deals rather than working with every publisher individually. And the way that that works varies from country to country. Yeah. Some countries can do uh, more blanket deals through the societies. Most can't. And then it's convincing them to help us, A, get all the publishers involved, and then B, using the, the collectives there to process the payments uh, so that we can send one check to a collection society and they'll add it into all their existing payments there rather than us having to pay each publisher directly. And the, and the rights change in every country. Uh, in some cases, we have to deal with, with different... Uh, uh, different licensing structures and different ways that uh, the whole process ha happens. Uh, so it's sort of a custom solution for every country. Uh, and you really do have to go to every country. The, the biggest challenge of international licensing is managing all the rights yeah. in each country. Because even a song that is available here and is owned by a publisher here can be represented by a different publisher in each different country. So getting a license from the original publisher here does not necessarily give you a license in the rest of the world. Yeah. You have to manage each country's rights individually. Yeah. Uh, so that's why at this point we're, we're supporting 30 countries. We'll be expanding to support more uh, soon, but it's, it's an extremely large mess. And, and from a technical perspective, it's very difficult yeah. to manage uh, tens of millions of tracks uh, with multiple publishers usually associated with each track in each country yeah. uh, and it becomes a very very big data problem yeah. more than anything uh. also digital distribution service one rpm chipped in with a, an interesting perspective on the issue as a business that has strong ties to brazil so here's emmanuel zunz ceo of the company and it's interesting to look at you know starting a company uh, that works in music distribution in Brazil because of course there's going to be some things that are different in terms of like uh, both how people purchase music and in terms of how artists uh, you know are used to distributing it of course there's different levels of, of, of uh, tech literacy I think uh, in different countries so how do you find the experience in Brazil? Yeah there's a lot of differences um, and you know one of the things um, and I think it's not just Brazil I would say all Latin America kind of suffers from a lack of knowledge of the tools that are out there. The, the markets in, in, in some of these emerging markets, whether it's Latin America or other parts of the world, are significantly behind what's happening in the US or in Europe, and hence that's why there's an opportunity. Uh, at the same time, you have an incredible music scene in these countries with just rich, rich cultural backgrounds and incredible music that just blows, blows me away every time, and that's, that's very exciting because we love music. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and you have the dynamics of the market, emerging market economies that are growing as well. Whereas, you know, the U.S. economy or the European economy are somewhat stagnant right now. You have markets like Brazil where it's huge growth because, you know, they're finally really starting to come into their own, whether it's technology, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, increased spending uh, power that they didn't have before, the more, middle, more of a middle class. So all these things together you know, combine, make it into an interesting uh, time to be working in these markets. But at the, on the flip side of that, there's they were ignored for so long, the artists and the industry was ignored for so long that a lot of artists don't understand how to navigate the digital landscape, how to release music in this new environment. They still feel a lot of times that you know, maybe getting a record deal is the best way to go. They don't know how to do DIY, do it yourself very well. So the trick in these markets is to educate very much at like what you know the pioneers of DIY and digital distribution did 14, 15 years ago here in the US. And ending this look at the international market is a Soundhound with the VP of Sales and Marketing, Katie McMahon. With international expansion uh, come and you know more and more stores being added to the, to the App Store by Apple and uh, more and more countries, uh, it comes like a challenge in the, in the tagging of, of the music as well. So how have you managed sort of the growth of the database and, and, and the ingestion of international uh, catalog as well? Yeah, and, and that's really important because while you need to have the, the massive hits, it's important in, in regional markets to likewise make sure you have local databases. And, and we work across um, every platform of 
major labels, independents, and we have we have artists coming to us directly saying, please ingest my albums or my collection because I know if fans are, are trying to sound hound and, and you want to give them that result. Yeah. So it's a big part of our effort to continuously grow our database. Another hot topic for South by Southwest is monetization and sustainability of digital music services, as well as the conversion of social activity to drive transactions. First up is Eric Davish, co-founder and chief content officer at Songza, talking about the company's monetization plans. Talking about of course, this uh, streaming, uh, you know, streaming radio, internet radio market is, uh, is a healthy one, uh, but there's also a, a question of, of course, uh, uh, how what, what percentage of you know companies' uh, income, of course, uh, goes to paying the licenses and to paying you know uh, for for the use of the music? So, what are you guys' uh, uh, main aims in terms of monetization on, on Songza? So, right now, we we monetize in a number of ways, um, mainly ad supported. So, uh, we have banner ad display advertisements that show up on our applications. Um, we also work with brands to create custom content. Um, so, you know, we might work with Victoria's Secret Pink or Mercedes-Benz to do, you know, customized playlists, maybe branded situations that are native, that are part of the concierge, that are part of the song's experience. Um, you know, we, and so, you know, it's, it's working a lot with brands. We've also done, you know, we also have a, a white label service that we've worked with one client on, but uh, it's not a huge part of our business. Um, but you know, it's it's working with brands to not only run media, um, but also to create custom engaging content that's part of the songs experience. That's going to make people's songs experience better and not serve as an interrupter. Second, I chatted to Jeff Pollock from Pollock Media Group about the market for subscription services in the U.S. And look, the the market for subscriptions. Let, let's just talk about America. So, uh, Netflix is what about 30 million right yeah. 30 million uh sirius xm is 24 million so you start as a music service you start looking at those numbers and you start saying okay so if spotify is about a million in the u.s the upside looks quite large you know you start saying that people are getting more and more used to paying for things and subscribing so uh subscription really is i think a a smart way to go they're just going to have to I don't think it's going to look like it looks like now, though. I think they're going to have to add things to it that make it sort of undeniable. Yeah. You know, something that really, you say, look at, I don't mind the $5 a month. It's not a lot of money. I have access to all these tracks. But I don't think it's the number of tracks yeah. as much as the other things that you're adding to the service that make me compelled to pay it. And now we hear from Scott Perry from Sperry Media on the potential to monetize visual hashtags with overlays on Facebook's timeline and much more. And so you were talking uh, briefly about you know the bridging, uh, connecting the, the part whereby everybody is sharing these uh, images and videos and stuff to bridging it to some sort of commercial uh, commercial level. So how do you think that's the best way to do? It? Is that with overlays, uh, trying to connect uh, with widgets, uh, getting people to buy stuff from from the media that is put out there? You know, I mean, overlay is going to be a great way because all of a sudden you have commerce opportunities that are a lot more implied and not uh, direct. Like, I mean, right now, whenever you post something on Facebook, it's like, yeah, here's a picture of the band, share this picture, like this picture, and all this. It's like, you know, I mean, you're going to do that to game the system for their, you know, edge rank algorithm. So the more shares and likes you get, the more it spreads across the fan base, which I think is complete bullshit. I mean, if you've got 10 million followers, 10 million followers should see your pictures. If you're not putting out interesting stuff, then fine, you deserve to lose those fans but it's not for Facebook to decide yeah. you know, as a creator now if you're if you're a brand like Oldsmobile and you're like just doing pictures that are disguised as ads then no I'm gonna drop you but if I'm a fan of a band I want to see what they're posting I don't want my social network you know uh, putting a, a guard up of it because yeah. I'm not as engaged with them as much as I should be as a marketing guy I follow a lot of bands I do not engage with bands. I'm following them for marketing purposes. But because I'm not engaged with them, sharing, liking, or whatever it is they want, uh, they drop out of my stream immediately. Yeah. Um, and so I think that yeah, Facebook acting as a gatekeeper for people that are creating legitimate content that fuels their traffic is really hurting them more than is the bands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, have, but you know, long story short, 
having a means of overlaying commerce opportunities without having to beg for that sell is going to make a big difference. Um, you know, same thing with YouTube. I mean, like YouTube's great when you can get, you know, I think it's like, what, $5,000 in, in, in ad, a shared ad revenue um, per million views, which is awesome. Uh, and of course, YouTube is the number one platform right now for, for music consumption. But, you know, at those levels, I mean, you're talking about maybe half a cent per viewer, per view, whatever it may be. Um, and we need to up that. So hopefully, um, I haven't talked directly to anybody at YouTube, but hopefully they're making a more robust system to where publishers, um, creators can have more obvious um, commerce opportunities within the ecosystem. I mean, like right now you find a video on YouTube uh, on your browser, there are links to purchase stuff below the uh, below the video. If you're watching it on your phone, then all of a sudden you have to click the little I button for information and hope that you can find stuff. And when you do find it, you hope that the commerce um, link is actually enabled for mobile purchasing, which most of them are not. They're you know, more robust sites that are best viewed on a desktop browser. Um, and that's something we have to change because people are realizing ad revenue is nice, publishing revenue is nice, but merchandise revenue is much nicer. Finally, I bring you Vicky Norman from 7Digital to talk about sustainability. I think that, that interests me, interests me uh, as well when you're talking about startups and, and API access is sustainability. So uh, when you talk to uh, you know, the startup and then you, of course you have to relate that to, to the deals that you already have the labels or ask labels for approval on, on the use of the catalog, like, do you find that it, there is a path to sustainability that is developing uh, for, for these type of deals? I think there is. I think there is. Um, but what I think is often the the biggest hindrance is I feel like we can provide a sustainable path and a launch into commercial deployment. But what is often most one of the most difficult things is the counterintuitiveness of music licensing. And we often get small companies that come to us because they've built us an app on Spotify. And they come to us and they say, wow, we built this app on Spotify, it was really great. And now we want to get serious. We want to work with you. We want to build our own. And they don't realize that they've built an interactive on-demand streaming application and the set of rights that they need to be able to do that as a standalone are not consistent with what a bedroom developer or a small unfunded startup can do. So then we try, we try to understand what they're what they're trying to accomplish and we try to guide them if there's a better music model that might be more cost effective and then they can transition once they get traction. Yeah. So it, with startups there's a lot of there's a lot of education that needs guidance, to be done. Yeah. And looking at the lyrics space, I asked Daryl Ballantyne at Lyric Find about monetization options in that field. For the, for the lyric sites, it's still mainly display ads, text ads. A lot of them are now, now that they're legal, they're able to sell a lot more premium advertising and go to real advertisers rather than just the networks and sort of lower, lower tier ads. Yeah, sure. So you'll see sites like Metro Lyrics that have site takeovers uh, and, uh, and wrappers around the, the site or yeah. Lyrics Mode will do that uh, as well and uh, other sites that are doing that. And, and some of the some of the sites that we license start to do more, uh, more sponsorship based uh, ad buys, and that I, display is still the, the predominant yeah. form. It's just uh, the targeting of the display that's changing. They're able to do a lot more targeting. They're able to go to real advertisers and sell at premium CPMs because now it's against vetted license quality content yeah. rather than UGC uh, disorganized stuff that that's on there. And finally, I ask Katie McMahon at SoundHound about the company's monetization channels. Yeah, well, to, to speak from the high level of what SoundHound Inc. does in terms of our, our business models, we are diversified across several revenue streams, yeah. one being licensing where our technology is used with, with some carriers around the world, for yeah. example, on um, a, a partnership API level. But inside of the SoundHound app that most everyone knows about, there are three models happening there. One would be the premium app. So. Yeah. If you, if you don't want to see banner ads and you want la creme de la creme of an experience, then you plunk down your money and you buy the paid app. Yeah. The second stream would be affiliate revenue and and the, the most obvious example of that in the app would be I buy the song right away and we share in, in that upside and SoundHound is a material 
vehicle for selling music. At this, at that volume, we are pushing people through the door of the music store and ease of functionality to download it. I hear, heard a song, bought it, download it, I get on the plane, I listen to it. But the third area that, that you, you mentioned is um, the advertising. And in the past year, we've invested very heavily. We've, we've hired on senior management and built up a team. We've opened up offices in New York, LA, and Chicago to be direct touch points with brands, agencies, because we really, we really are lucky in that we're in this vertical that, that is actually quite wide, and it's yeah. music, it's emotional. Every brand has some degree of touch point with music, and those brands that really want to reach users who are explorers yeah. want to come through SoundHound and offer that, and, and the RDO Maps um, is a great example of it. And moving on from monetization to issues around music publishing, there were a couple of interesting points made in the shows. The first from Frank Johnson, CEO at Medianet. Uh, one of the big areas of, of uh, need and, and growth is uh, also the licensing of, of music, uh, looking at, you know, uh, for example, publishing uh, uh, clearances and, and, and all that side of things, yes. which, is a, which is a huge area where there's not that many companies that actually work actively into it. You know, RiseFlow was one of them, but they, they got acquired by Google and now they don't really um, operate to, to, to uh, outward-facing clients anymore. Um, so that's something that you guys are, are, are really looking into, right? So we, we've recently launched, as of the beginning of this year, our own service to supply rights acquisition, not publishing, as well as administration of those rights and payment and reporting and compliance for those rights. Awesome. Uh, we did it... Uh, as a, as a response to our customers trying to simplify their supply chain and to have to work and reduce the number of people they have to work f with. Uh, for folks who deliver digital media experiences, it's, it's challenging to integrate, uh, working with third parties, multiple third parties, you're doing a lot of ID matching and integration. And so enabling them to really work with one full service partner that does not only the content acquisition and content management, also fulfillment and then reporting all the way through publishing uh, has been very, very something very well received. Um, we, we serve a rights managed catalog, so it yeah. comes with uh, recording rights from the labels, and now we're able, we've always been able providing publishing rights, but now we're able to provide much more customized solutions for yeah. folks, and more importantly, and the part that's really hard is to ensure they get reported and, com and, and paid and the compliance is right. Of course, and so uh, in a sense, like you already have a, a, a lot of data from, from what you've been doing all along, and you just like, you know, you created a, an extra layer of, of, of understanding for that to provide this, this new service, right? Yeah, it was really natural for us to enter this business. We, we have very sophisticated content ingestion and management systems yeah. that are built to deal with just an incredibly high volume of track ingestion and content ingestion and metadata ingestion. So we were able to basically look at that and, and add another and extend the databases out to add a publishing layer. So now we can match the actual track, the compositions Yep. to the tracks and so we can when we when a track is played we now know who the publishers the writers the administrators are and and we can align those yeah. and i also talked with uh, jeff price founder of tunecore about publishing administration and the future of the industry of course you know there's a rise now of uh, publishers that are renowned for their for their accounting systems and, and they're becoming more popular like cobalt for example they're doing very well because because of that and artists kind of songwriters trust them to to account better than others yep. um, on, on what's happening on that front. So do you, do you see a revolution coming on this front where songwriters are going to license their their copyright instead of just giving it away and to, to companies that can account for it but not actually give away the copyright itself? Yeah, so what you just described is called publishing administration yeah. as opposed to co-publishing. And that's where you're literally hiring someone to go and work for you. You control and maintain ownership of your copyrights. Co-publishing is where you sell your copyright and somebody else becomes in charge of it and you make a small piece of it. And the answer is, yeah. I mean, to me, the whole music, new music industry is about serving the artist. It's not about exploiting the artist. And the entity that can best serve the artist, meaning go out and provide these tasks for them with the most efficiency as quickly as possible, with as much transparency as possible, they'll win. It's not about trying to get an artist to give you ownership. It's about creating such a valuable system that they choose to be there. And you know what? That's hard. That's hard too. But whoever could do that, they'll win. And that's really what I wanted to do. And you know, the, the easy way is trick the artist in giving up rights yeah. or just buy them out. Then you can do whatever you want to. Um, so transparency, the digital music age is transparent in a way that analog 
never was. Talking about publishing, lyrics are a big phenomenon that is continuing to grow, especially with lyric videos. Let's start by looking at 1RPM's Emmanuel Zun's stance on lyric videos. Yeah, and how do you feel about um, you know still image videos and lyric videos? You know, I know a lot of people are recommending artists to put those up on YouTube uh, to increase views and and generate uh, some extra cash because actually people do 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 view a lot of those. Uh, so, do you encourage your artists to do that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because um, you know. YouTube is the largest music service in the world right now, you know, unofficially. But even though I think they're planning on doing something more official, I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not. I don't, I don't really know enough about what they're trying to do. But the fact of the matter is, is that I think it's something like 40% of all music traffic is on YouTube. It's really impressive. And it's open to everybody. And what we like about YouTube is that it is free for the fans, pretty much. It's ad-supported, but it's free to the fans. But artists can can do really well on YouTube if they know how to use the services. The thing is, it's actually quite complicated to understand how to maximize YouTube's potential. And so a lot of people, uh, and there are different types of partnership you know, structures. So just because you have a YouTube partnership doesn't, you don't have the content ID that we have. You don't get the premium channel, uh, premium advertising that we have. So I think, you know, we feel we can add a lot of value to artists by doing that. And that's a big focus for our business right now. And Daryl Valentine from Lyric Find, of course, has some interesting points when it comes to lyric videos, especially in regards to the royalty side of these. Especially looking at lyrics video, how, how do you think you know that they can be monetized? Because of course, it's a different story than just accessing a lyric from from a separate app. And so, does that require a separate like live dis discussion on the last in front, or what's your take on that? It we've had a lot of conversations with the publishers about it to to try to figure out what the best way to monetize lyric videos are and how we can help power those with our synchronization data and then and generally I think the model for those ends up being some sort of a revenue share yeah. on on the advertising as long as it's with a reliable partner that you know is going to to monetize properly uh, but it, it's tricky because you end up not getting necessarily the same rates yeah. uh, because you've, you've suddenly got another rights holder in the picture with the label from the master recording yeah. uh, and and that will take a big chunk of, of the ad revenue as well. So it takes some tweaking uh, of the model. And there's yeah. there are a few different services that uh, we think we might be able to have have models figured out that the publishers are, are on board with uh, to properly license and monetize them. So it, it's it's definitely a big a, a big priority for both us and the publishers to get the right model behind it and. And there's going to be some experimentation and we'll, we'll see what comes out, but uh, it's, it's definitely not going away and, and it won't remain as unlicensed as it is, as it is now. It is today, yeah. It's just going to be juggling like, the priorities of the, the, the publishers with other master owners, so if that, the, the lyrics are used within the videos, maybe the publisher can get a bigger cut yeah. of the advertising uh, on that video rather than if it was just like a, a normal uh, movie shot. Yeah, yeah the right. publisher definitely ends up with a bigger piece. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, that essentially takes that visual piece uh, of of a typical music video, uh, and then there's still the master recording and then the, the traditional uh, publishing yeah. right. Soundhound are also making a move in the lyrics space, and here's what Katie McMahon had to say. Also, the other thing that we're heavily focused on is our live lyrics um, database, if you will, having songs, the lyrics, but making those live lyric eyes. So that's a Soundhound feature where literally if I ID a song, if I'm standing in the coffee shop, the song information comes, the beautiful graphic, but that song's lyrics are moving in sync with the song at the moment in time. Yeah. And that is just a, a re-emergence of the of the love for lyrics. Yeah, yeah, sure. And do you guys power that service yourself, or do you have a third? We do. No, no. That, that's that's a wholly owned and created in-house technology from Soundhound Inc. So to be able to continually take songs and make sure that the lyrics aren't static, but they're li live lyrics, that likewise is part of a, a growth internally in our in our backend database that the team of, of engineers are set across. And the same the same thing on the licensing side, right? You, you license the, the right. tracks itself. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. And in today's digital music space, there are more and more tools to help artists communicate with their fan base and to help them get exposure online. Here I take a look at some of the tools and tips that I assembled during South By, starting with Matt Ho from Livestream talking about the platform's potential for bands. 
So talking about uh, live stream, you have a huge uh, spectrum of people that, that can use uh, the live stream service. Uh, so let's start with the sort of the, the more you know basic uses of the platform, just to cater for bands that maybe are watching this and may want, be wanting to use it for, for, for their own stuff. So at the very basic level, how, how can musicians and bands use live stream to enhance the relationship with their fans? Sure, so we have a number of different options for a number of different consumers, as you said. Um, and we've tried to rethink over the last year or so the way that our pricing is structured to cater to all of those people. Um, prior to the beginning of 2012, Livestream was set up very similarly to a lot of the other competitors in the space where costs associated with live streaming were based around a um, number of viewer, uh, viewer hours consumed, um, which was very hard to predict. And then uh, was either advertising based, so pre-rolls running in the content, or you would have to pay a monthly fee to remove that. We've kind of reworked all of those pricing models over the last year or so. So we actually have three basic options, just trying to simplify it for our customers. We have a free to broadcast option, which is ideal for, you know, for many of our users who don't have a budget at all. Um, so it's free to broadcast, um, it's ad free, so you're not being bombarded with cheap beer ads in the middle of your broadcast and something that you might not want to align yourself with. Um, the limitations in terms of functionality to that is that it, the content can only live live on the live stream platform. Yeah. And so your viewers, you're basically directing to your channel page and what they actually have to do to be able to view it, you know, for you to not have to pay a fee is that they have to create their own live stream account or sign in through Facebook. So we're not making any money from the broadcast, but what we are getting is viewer data essentially and learning about, you know, learning about you, learning about your audience and being able to hopefully build a uh, consistent business. Then the middle tier is $49 a month. Um, that's no sign in. So again, it's still exclusive on the platform but you can tweet out or promote your channel URL. A viewer comes in and watches it and they can do that passively without doing anything. So no sign in, um, no creating of accounts, um, but obviously there is a charge then on your end. And then the top tier is $3.99 a month. If you sign a year contract, it's $3.33. Um, that again, passive viewing, it enables you to take that player, to take our player or essentially our entire event page and put that anywhere on the web. So completely uh, embeddable. So um, that's the mo you know those are the three basic plans. We think it's simplified the the landscape um, for uh, music partners and for partners in a number of different verticals. And now let's take a look at Jumplify with the CMO Moses Soyola talking about what the company can do for your artist or for you as an artist. Jamplify is a social marketing platform that enables artists and other digital brands to really motivate their fans to spread the word for them and activate the word of mouth potential in their fans. Yeah. So artists can go to Jamplify and create campaigns where they're offering fans rewards based on how many other people those fans drive to check out that artist online, whether yeah. that's an artist's YouTube videos, an artist's shows, an artist's iTunes releases, anything with a URL, they can use Jamplify to promote and get their fans to spread the word for them. Well, what we see that really works well are sort of one-of-a-kind experiential rewards. So Jasmine Viegas, she's a pop star uh, who used to tour with Justin Bieber. She recently ran a campaign on our platform to promote her YouTube video, and she, for her top reward, was giving away the outfit that she wore in that YouTube video, in her music video. She was giving away the specific outfit that she wore in that, in that video. And so her 13 to 17-year-old fans, which are you know, <laughs> just incredibly active on social media, incredibly rabid, she had 670 of those fans drive 190,000 other people to check out that YouTube video. And, and it's because they were competing to win the outfit that Jasmine was wearing in that video. So, yeah. so what we've, we've, we've built Jamplify to cater to all levels of, of artists, um, whether that's your 50 Cents or your Katie Armitage, who's a small up and coming indie country act. And what we've done is we've structured it such that you can pay based on the number of referrals that Jamplify that you're able to actually get out of your fans when they're sharing with Jamplify. And yeah. so, uh, if you went to our website right now, you would see that you could pay $50 for up to 500 referrals, which is for your really small indie acts. You could pay $100 for up to 1,000 referrals, or you could pay $500 for unlimited referrals at this yeah. point. And so, granted, these numbers are things that are always in flux, but, um, but basically what we want is for anyone that has a fan base to be able to use this platform and actually see some value and see some results out of it at a price that makes sense for them. I also caught up with Eric Walforce, CTO at SoundCloud, about their new plans and the new prices announced during South by Southwest. 
We've been really, really busy sort of over the last couple of months, uh, and we're proud to today to announce basically two things, two major updates. Yeah. Um, we have new pro uh, pro plans for our users, so we're simplifying our pro accounts. We make them cheaper and more powerful. Um, so that's a great update. That's huge for for the creators. We've been listening to their feedback, gathering feedback, and and creating these new new plans. Um, yeah. So that's a big update for us. Um, the other big thing we're doing is we've introduced a new tier. Um, yeah. Within these pro plans, we have something called pro pro partner yeah. um, tier, um, and there we're basically we're running like a, an experiment. Um, so it's very early stage. Um, and we're doing this with with music and audio partners, but also a couple of brands. Yeah. So um, and what we're doing is we're experimenting with some new features, um, and essentially this, this, these features are all revolving around sort of visualizing the sounds even more. Um, something called moving sounds. Yeah. Um, and moving sounds are essentially so it's 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 a piece of audio, um, but along with the audio, you have a, you have time visuals that you can upload alongside um, of the audio. So so basically, it's it's one sort of uh, holistic unit. So as you as you play the audio, the audio is obviously the main thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, at, while you play the audio, you basically have this big uh, rich visuals that are timed timed to the audio as you play. So I'm back to you know the the, the new uh, pricing announcement. Oh, I think. So how are they structured? Just so that uh, people can have an idea of, of where the pricing is ended up as. Yes, we've we've consistently heard that piece of feedback that you know, hey, I'm creating a lot of audio and I'd, I'd love some more space, but you know, your top tier, your unlimited tier is too expensive. So we went ahead and fixed that basically. So yeah. so we now have a, a top tier um, that's very simple. It's 99 euros per per year, nine dollar uh, nine euros a month, um, and you know, it's completely unlimited. So you have all of the top features that used to be in the very expensive accounts before. They're all rolled into that account. Um, uh, so that's very simple. Still, the entry-level account is at, uh, at 29 euros um, a year. Yeah, a year, which gives you four hours of storage, already a lot of um, some powerful stats yeah. uh, and other stuff as well. And I talked about Tumblr with Ray Vata, social media manager and strategist at VH1. Uh, and Tumblr is an interesting, is an interesting platform because a lot of people use it as a, as a blogging platform, but there are a lot of interactive features that perhaps are not quite so immediate to the to the first hand user I'm, I'm not sure like uh, do you think that everybody's is getting all of uh, everything out of Tumblr that they should or is there a lot of stuff that that is still like needs to be exposed a bit better I think that Tumblr is ends up being kind of what you make of it and the community you make of it so I wouldn't want to say people aren't getting what they should out of it because I think yeah. if you're using it and you're happy and you want to just be a photo blog that puts out photos of your lunch every day yeah. that is a perfectly acceptable and great use for Tumblr that is like awesome. Um, I think that there's a lot of subset of community that's really been built there in different ways that like to the first time user isn't going to really experience that if you don't start searching a tag, if you don't start looking for people there to kind of find how they're doing it and then mimic that yeah. world. So like uh, one of the things I, uh, when I studied the linguistics of fan culture, I was studying um, live journal communities at the time because Tumblr didn't exist. And and Twitter didn't even exist when I was doing um, academic stuff on it. And now as I've seen the change of where fans used to build fan sites, like very dedicated fan sites, and now they are building fan tumblers. And the tumblers all interact and are these sources of incredible and also sometimes very repetitive information because if they reblog the same thing, yeah. they reblog and edit the same picture with a new filter on top of it. All this kind of like very, very, very like obsessive and heavy levels of, of media coming out. And it's actually kind of amazing because that's, what fans actually want. They're, they're looking for that very immediate stuff. The Twitter as well, the twi fan Twitters have taken over the presence of a fan club, fan you know page, things like that, because it's so much more immediate and they can talk to you really fast. If you have a question for the person who runs it, if you have a tip, if you saw the celebrity you love or the musician you love out on the street, you can tweet at those things and, and let everybody know what is happening as opposed yeah. to you know the, the lag of, oh, I got to upload the photo from my, you know, my camera or I got to like develop photos, you know, that's too much. Um, but yeah, with, with Tumblr especially, it's very, especially with fans, extremely a place that they talk a lot. They actually reblog and have these conversations, these threads that go on forever and ever. And and you have to kind of like figure out how to jump in. And sometimes it's a snapshot of a moment. Yeah. That's a conversation that then becomes something you as a piece of media itself. And sometimes it's still going on. It's still organic. People are still adding to it and adding a joke and adding another picture, another GIF reaction. It's It's very deep. And the first time you look at it, you're like, this is cool. And then you look deeper and you're like, wow, there is a lot going on here that I don't know anything about. And for the final tool of this segment, we look at the Give It video editing app. 
Give it is the easiest way to create videos right from your mobile phone or iPad. Uh, and we really wanted to reimagine how people create videos. So you just tap on the phone whenever you see the good parts and we automatically stitch it together. And then you can add special effects and music and then share it with just a few friends or the world. Yeah, looking at sort of how uh, Give It works on a, on a commercial background. Uh, so how, how do you guys, uh, how, how is this structured and, and how, how do people pay for it essentially? Yeah, so it's really free to begin with. And so, and you get five gigabytes of free storage, which is a lot that's equals about 45 minutes of video so that yeah. most people you think about short form that's a lot of video um, but then on top of that if you want more if you need more uh, you, for $30 a year uh, you get a hundred more gigs that's a lot of video yeah uh, and and it's so it's, <laughs> thank you um, it, and so it really we tried to make it really easy and fast and our, our focus is really about getting people to try out the app and, and I think they're gonna really enjoy it yeah. and and I think for the casual user they'll never reach that five gig cap yeah. but they'll still find it very useful Mobile, of course, is a huge priority for many companies given that users are consuming more and more content on smartphones and tablets. So I asked the Universal Republic's Theda Sandiford about how to make the most of the mobile space from a digital marketing standpoint and what her view on artist apps is. Okay, okay well, one thing is I personally hate artist vanity apps. Yeah. Um, they, uh, when that was the trend, the trend was oh, we're going to offer something exclusive through this mobile app. Well, they never offered anything exclusive through the mobile app. It was always more of what you can get on Twitter or Facebook or on the uh, artist's uh, webpage. Yeah. Um, so I don't think the, the experience of that exclusive sort of mobile thing, the only thing you get for it really is the push messaging yeah. on the mobile phone. And honestly, that's not enough of a reason to have a mobile app. The other reason why artist vanity mobile apps are, are I believe, are a mistake is that um, you have to market and sell that app. Um, once it's in the app store, if you're not in the top 20 or the second page of people looking through free apps, no one's finding you and they're not looking for you. Um, and if you're not ranked there, you don't really exist. Um, and the core business of a record company is to sell music. So the same amount of energy, effort, um, and marketing yeah. has to go into selling these apps, which you then can't sell music to, to yeah. um, uh, as you would sell a music product. So uh, either download, stream, or, or, or some sort of view you're driving on YouTube. Yeah. So it. It, uh, right now, it just doesn't scale, and yeah. it doesn't make sense. I've switched uh, every artist that says, I want a mobile app. I said, great, go build it on yourself. Go ahead. And, and, here's, and here's my recommendation how you would want to market it. Um, but we're going we're gonna to make our money doing what we know uh, that we could sell. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so all our artist sites are now mobile optimized sites. So I find more people are searching on the phone looking for something and all the data I see shows that uh, the mobile uh, uh, the mobile search and uh, people coming to the artist websites from their phones is greater than ever before at least uh, at least averaging anywhere from 30 to 70 percent um, depending on the artists and the genre um, are coming from 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 mobile they're not sitting so there doing no a flash no 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 <laughs> flash and, <laughs> and limited on HTML5 yeah. but really you know building off building a off a platform that has responsive design that's really looking at um, yeah. Um, looking at how people across the board um, less time spending uh, testing various browsers more time focused on people's consumption patterns on mobiles and tablets of course. and staying on mobile we hear from live streams Matt Ho on the adoption of mobile devices for live streaming and the challenge it poses mobile so uh, of course uh, like with cameras the, you know the iPhone is probably like the most popular camera uh, to shoot photos from on, on Flickr and a number of other platforms and uh, is that the same thing with uh, with live stream in terms of uh, you know, the low end users do they use mostly their mobile devices to create the streams or is there another type of device that might be more popular on that? Um, mobile devices are definitely popular and definitely growing uh, I wouldn't say the majority of content on our platform was generated by mobile devices um, 
we very much historically tended to target uh, mid-level and professional broadcasters. We want the best content on our platform to attract as many viewers as possible. So I think, you know, still the vast majority of it comes through, you know, computers running our software or, you know, high-end production setups. 4G was kind of a big watershed for us. Up until, you know, the launch of, you know, uh, certainly in North America, AT&T, Verizon, etc., moving, you know, more wholeheartedly into 4G, we'd been uh, a little bearish on the mobile broadcast market. We felt that, you know, broadcasting through your iPhone on a 3G network didn't give a sufficient quality of broadcast and content for viewers to watch. Um, and we didn't want to create or enable our partners and our clients to create um, a poor experience for, you know, for their fans because that reflects badly on all of us. So 4G was a bit of a watershed. Um, we pushed out our live stream for producers app, which is a really great app and enables you to stream, um, you know, in very high quality on 4G networks or through Wi-Fi. Um, and we're seeing, you know, a growing amount of content being produced from those, applica uh, from those applications and from those devices. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, iPhone and Android we're on at the moment, looking at, you know, looking at Windows, looking at BlackBerry and stuff like that, but still focusing very much on those big two operating systems. And I think we'll begin to see as those networks, as those 4G networks and, you know, beyond 4G increase. Um, as I say, going back to the first question, the, the first thing to always think through is your internet connection and how you're going to get the content out there. As 4G improves, as the networks grow, um, as the quality and the speed of data upload and transfer increases, I think we'll see more and more producers using that as a, as a way to go live. And finally, I asked Vicky Norman from 7Digital about their mobile app and how it fits into their strategy. And let's talk about accessibility. That's a really big thing for 7Digital as well. You, you guys have a, 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 an app on Windows 8, which is you know, not, not that many companies have yet. Uh, you have a, a really good Android app that just got updated, and you got an iOS app as well, which is uh, cool because it offers iOS users an alternative to buying tracks on iTunes. Uh, so how important is accessibility through your own direct app uh, for the company? I think it's becoming increasingly important and our business has evolved pretty dramatically. It used to be that we had our direct-to-consumer efforts and then everything else was B2B and white labels yeah. and lots of siloed approaches and what we've seen now is that these things are blending together more and the the seven digital account, the login, the user's music collection works across all different devices and that's really really important because unlike like you know I'm an Apple fan but it's kind of a siloed approach and if you fall too far outside of Apple devices you can't access your music yeah. and we really want to be able to let users buy their music yeah. and access it whether they have an iPhone a Blackberry a Windows phone an Android tablet or a Dell PC you know yeah. we want it all and that's a big issue because uh, I know a lot of people that, for example, are sticking with the iPad but are getting Samsung phones instead of the iPhone. So exactly. then what, you, what do you do? You know, if you have MP3s, then you can still do things around that to bring your library in. But if you want to stream it, like with iTunes Match or anything like that, you're, you miss out. So yeah. Absolutely. And I think, it's, I think that it is a, you know, music is so personal and it's really important for people to be able to always have their music with them. And it, and it, it makes no sense from a consumer proposition to say, Oh well, just because you now have a Samsung phone, you can't you can't listen to that. It doesn't that doesn't make any sense. And so we're trying to keep we're trying to keep keep the users and their music collection consistent across all devices. But it's harder than it may seem. Yeah. The streaming space is bubbling with excitement, and there is so much going on, so many developments uh, and new deals each day. So let's hear from Jeff Pollock from Pollock Media first about his take on the coming war. The next 12 months is going to be very interesting on the streaming side. The streaming yeah. wars that are coming, the YouTube and Googles uh, against the new Beats Daisy that's going to be launched. And, and then you have Amazon and Apple and Spotify. And it really is going to be fascinating to see who survives this because yeah. this it not, it's, there's not room for everybody. And, um, and what services people bring to bear Bundling, I think, is going to be critical in, yeah. in, in, in the future, like with uh, Cricket and Muse. They've shown that bundling really works, and I think all of us who have a large uh, cable bill, which we all do, and if you're a sports fan, you know, you're not really complaining when you're paying for the NFL package if you're a particular um, sports fan. So I think that bundling with a carrier, we're going to see that it's been discussed. Yeah. 
but in a big way, I think that that is a, a way that you know we'll actually see somebody be able to do that. But I think that these, if you're a, if you're a fight fan, you're going to enjoy the next uh, 12 to 24 months because this is going to be one massive battle for people's attention. attention. Then I asked uh, Theda Sandiford from Universal Republic uh, what her take on streaming services is and I was also wondering whether there's more they could do for the artists. Uh, you know, on, on, the on the streaming side, uh, talking about streaming services, of course, uh, they are getting much bigger, you know, they're becoming an important part of, of any really uh, marketing, uh, marketing strategy. But uh, at the same time, uh, up until now, they haven't really done anything for the artist in terms of offering additional functionality uh, when it comes to, you know, maybe presenting the artist in a certain way or helping sort of... Well, I don't, I don't know. That's not entirely true. Entirely true I yeah. mean, Spotify has their emerging artist program. Yeah. They've actually made a commitment to kind of breaking an artist. They want to show that they can do that through streaming. Yeah. I think streaming providers is a tremendous discovery mechanism. Yeah. Um, I like to use them on my mobile phone. Um, I, I like to be able to cache uh, a playlist on my phone so I can listen on the subway, on the train. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I like the ability to be able to want, uh, consume what I want when I want it and take it with me. Yeah. Um, I also am very bullish on, on streaming services. Um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, downloads have now surpassed CDs and it took, I guess, close to 15 years for that to happen. I suspect it's going to take around seven years for streaming services to displace the downloads and we're probably into two of those seven years already. Yeah. So within five years we're going to see that. Um, so as they grow and as a lot of these um, streaming services really get their mobile apps together, yeah. even though a lot is moving to mobile, the, the experience is still kind of kludgy. I mean, I can sit here, I'm not going to name names, but I don't think any of them really do an exceptional job on mobile. There's things that I think as a consumer you would expect to be able to do. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like it, they have all these playlist making apps, but you can't make the playlist from your mobile phone. You have to do that on your do that on your desktop and then it, it, it yeah, and then sync it up. Seamless. And we know that that's actually content creation, and the number of people that actually do that are small. But that's how you get gain scale. Yeah. You have to have that because those content creators share with their friends, who then who they bring in. Yeah. Uh, so they need to fix a lot of things uh, in their UI design. Um, but there's time. Yeah, for sure. There's time. Uh, there is definitely time, and yeah, <laughs> I have plenty of ideas on how they can do it. <laughs> And streaming brings its own set of challenges. So let's hear from the president of CD Baby, Brian Felsen, on how streaming impacted them in terms of uh, accounting and how they managed to solve that situation. And uh, you know, the backend side of a service like yours uh, must have become really difficult to deal with in the last five, uh, four or five years uh, with all the streaming services coming into play. Uh, so, and of course, a service that has hundreds of thousands, of, you know, of, of tracks. Uh, it's, it's even more difficult. So, uh, how, how did you build that part of it up, and was it was it tricky to find a, to find the right way to really uh, account for and report on on the streaming royalties? Yes, yes. Uh, the short is is that we screwed it up royally. Uh, there's really we were going along merrily. We had a couple hundred thousand uh, um, artists, and um, it, it, what happened was we we were growing faster than we had projected, and then we did a deal with Spotify, and Spotify literally broke our accounting. It was like some Suddenly, we had millions of lines of incoming stream going to uh, four decimal places after the penny, and it was like it was total like all nighters, all weekends, just trying to be able to account for it all. And you know, now we have we have it. We have probably the most robust accounting system in the industry. We handle almost five million tracks um, and millions and millions of lines of streaming data, which we can display every single one for our dozens of partners. But man, it wasn't easy. <laughs> Moving away from streaming, uh, radio is still an important player when it comes to music, and I asked Brian how he sees artists relating to radio these days. Uh, looking at stuff like a radio, for example, uh, you know, you, you have a service, you have a link to, to, to a service also that offers some help on, on that front. How, how do you see artists relating to, to, to radio these days? 
Physical radio is very interesting because um, it's uh, sort of in decline, but it is an important way uh, for discovery. But there are a lot of predatory companies out there which will you'll charge you thousands of dollars for packages to either print CDs and, and send them out or to work radio. And we've not found anything that's provided consistent value to the bulk of our artists. So what we're about is enabling artists to really get discovered within one of our 850 genres and people who like to listen to them. And then if that's radio, great. If that's in, not if that's non-interactive or if that's interactive online radio, that's great. We just want them to get out there and get, get discovered and get paid. And Soundhound also has a new interesting play when it comes to the radio market. So let's hear from Katie McMahon as to what's that all about. Um, you are talking about the, the, the radio space, which is a, a really interesting uh, angle for, for you because, you know, I know other competitors have, have gone into the, more the, the TV market, but a radio is such an untapped potential and a huge audience for music lovers that, right. you know, so often you hear a track and you sound hounded because Right. You're not on a digital radio, or you know, you're still on a normal FM channel or whatever. And so, what's the partnership all about? Uh, tell me about and it. That's perfect. Is you, you just articulated the exact use case that so much of our user base is already doing, and that's yeah. a key point. The user behavior does not have to get taught; it's already there. I, I hear a song on a radio. I know. I soundhound it. I yeah. get my information. So we looked at that pool of use case and and looked at an industry named radio, terrestrial traditional radio and looked at the problems that radio is having in the digital age. So what's happened in terrestrial radio, when the internet came along, it, it threw radio for a loop, un not understanding how to quickly go with the curve for monetizing. So the likes of a Pandora really ate into the radio industry's bread and butter, and bread and butter is who funds it, and that's advertisers and yeah. brands that want to reach. But what we know is that audio channel is still incredibly compelling. If you're in a car or you're listening to a personality, a talk show, or a radio host that has a two-hour show with country music as highlights, yeah. you're really invested. You trust that, that personality. You gain a lot of information. There's huge value there. So what we've done is partnered with uh, the U.S.'s biggest radio syndicate player, they're called Dial Global, yeah. and what Dial understands is that our technology is that leapfrog potential on how radio can monetize. Yeah. So what we've done jointly is release something called Soundhound for Radio. Now this allows any program to asynchronously be identified. So what this means is during the broadcast, at any stage, you can sound hound and receive the intended result. Wow. Now, if there's still music playing, if Taylor Swift is playing and you sound hound it, we will have product fidelity where there's the artist's name, the track, the lyrics, but part of the real estate in the result will go towards either the promotion or the brand advertiser. And finally, Universal Republic's Theda Sandiford, who has an extensive background in radio, talks about how that medium's role is changing in a campaign to break an act. I mean, we have multiple formats and tens of thousands of radio stations. So, um, you know, a band like of Monsters and Men, uh, which broke out of South by Southwest last year, uh, started in one format and is that same song, Little Talks, is just now crossing to top 40 a year later. Yeah. So I, I think I, I can only speak from the United States perspective because of the, the proliferation of all the different um, uh, genres of radio stations and the time it takes from one song to move from one genre, from alternative, triple A to alternative, to rock, to top 40, that can take 18 months to pass through that entire cycle. Wow. Um, I, I've noticed with apps like iHeartRadio, LastFM for, for CBS, and um, uh, I believe, uh, well, I, I'll just talk about those two, because those are probably the two biggest change, CBS and uh, Clear sure. Channel. They are doing interesting things with their with their mobile uh, radio apps. They're they have developing artist programs. Yeah. They're doing things within their apps where they will play music that they haven't even added to the radio station yet to warm it up to see what data they get back. Are people requesting it? If they play yeah. that song after another song, and 
how, through the mobile app, um, what is the reaction? Are people skipping? Are they staying around longer? Uh, and they're using this data to that they then take to their terrestrial radio stations um, and, and kind of inform some of the, the programming decision process. That's so, awesome. It's, it's almost like A-B testing. Like that I think so. Been doing yeah, ages, and it's really awesome that they're getting there and are starting to do that. So um, they also recognize that um, their local radio station is a local resource, yep. whereas uh, since so much of the programming is on a nationalized basis, national chains, syndicated programs coming in, that the local, the local flavor of that radio station is really reflected on the website. Yep. Um, so I, you see that there are there's content and effort to create content when the artist is up at the radio station that can live on in an archive type environment uh, on the local uh, radio station website. So all that's very encouraging. Yeah. And talking about internet radio specifically, there are still rumors flying around about the potential introduction of a variation on the Internet Radio Fairness Act that was axed towards the end of last year to lower the rates for services like Pandora, for example. Uh, so I asked the uh, Sound Exchange's Artist Relations Manager, Sean Glover, what his thoughts on the matter are. I mean, the bottom line with that story is we're, we're going to fight. We're big advocates of music and musicians and the creators of those music. So. Um, any way, shape, or form that we can make sure that they have a viable, um, uh, viable payments for their hard work, we're definitely going to be there yeah. on that forefront as the leaders in the digital music space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Sound Exchange's main mission at South by Southwest was to get people to register with the organization. So let's hear some more on that. Of course, and, and here, here at uh, South by Southwest, of course, the, the, the main message at the stand is to really like try and get the word out that, that you guys are there and that artists need to, to get in touch. So, so how big of a problem is it for you uh, to match uh, the songs to, to the artists and make the payments accordingly? Well, actually, um, I mean, we, we do a great job at that. I think one of the, the one thing that uh, sort of hamstrings us, if you will, is that we, we need artists to register to pay them. Yeah. We're kind of similar, you know, kind of like still the new guys on the block as compared to other organizations that does this type of work. Um, so one of the main reasons why we're here is to register artists, uh, as you can see from our board here, and, and to get artists to become members yeah. of yeah. Sound Exchange. Moving on to the legal front, uh, one of the issues that is coming up time and time again when it comes to the legal side of the music industry is that of transformative works, especially with the explosion of uh, the cover versions market. So I talked with uh, Cristelia Garcia from the George Washington Law School about what the current situation is in the US on that particular front. It's, it's really hard to control what happens to your copyright once it goes out in the wild. So, you know, just a general overview on, on what's the current situation with, with that and, 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 and what's happening on the, on the front legal in the U.S. Yeah, the transformative rights are everywhere, um, especially in the age of social media where, you know, music is so readily available and it is ready in a digital format and technology allows us to manipulate that and, and change it as we see, whether it be some sort of a viral clip, an animated GIF that has a three-second clip of music in it, an actual remix, um, mashups, uh, sampling for people who are just bedroom artists, right? So there's a lot of that. Um, the copyright laws, um, obviously in 1976 when the latest version of most of these were done, there now there have been updates, 95, 98, but even so, like 98, you know, even some um, uh, revisions to the DMCA 2002, this is still like ancient history now in 2013, um, but they've accounted to say, you know, we have section 115, uh, which is basically the compulsory license to cover songs, um, but we've seen, and the most recent um, thing in the news was Glee and Jonathan Colton, right? So this kind of shows the whole transformative rights and how they aren't really treated exactly like original artists, even if they have brought something to the table, making them derivative instead of transformative. Um, so in that case, as, as, as many of your viewers will undoubtedly have seen, Jonathan Colton, who's an independent musician, uh, got a compulsory license, which means he can just get the license under Section 115 to do a cover of uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot's Baby Got Back. Yep. He did a romantic serenade version of it. Um, 
Glee, the popular television show, although Jonathan Colton got the license to do the cover, what he didn't get and what's required separately, and many artists don't recognize this, their management and lawyers may not you know, tell them, is that in order to get a copyright on the cover that they've got, they then need to get a different separate permission from the original copyright holder to copyright their cover. That's what Jonathan Colton didn't have. And that's what allowed Fox and the Glee program to take his cover verbatim, not only use it on the show without paying, but then go so far as to copyright it themselves and sell it on iTunes. And so that's what happened. Uh, well, it remains to be seen, legally, what they sort of work out amongst themselves. But I think what this highlights is the lack of protection that we have for derivative works. Um, because, you know, A, many artists don't know that they need the separate permission to get a copyright on it, and B, that they need permission at all. You know, they've created this new work and the original artist can say, meh, I don't like it, you can't have it, right? Um, and then they'd have to resort to, um, you know, fair use under Section 107 and, you know, try to get some free speech, you know, arguments going, such as a parody, for example. Um, but that's a, a very different road to travel down, and that's not what most... Uh, most mashups and remixes are about a parody or a criticism that would allow fair use under 107 would be a critique of the work. Most mashups and remixes are a fan, you know, paying tribute to it, saying I really love this and here's what I've done. Um, ironically, our law protects critiques and things that make fun of something but don't protect fans who are actually uh, trying to pay homage to something. So yeah. maybe something we need to work on. So the process for somebody that's doing a, a cover, at least in the US, would be to, to get a compulsory license once they do the cover, but then if the cover starts getting traction, is, is, if it's particularly original, they should probably pursue trying to get this second type of permission. It's probably harder to obtain because it's not compulsory. Right. Argue to try to get that secondary permission, whether or not it's gained traction, because you know, you, know, you, know. you may you may want to get it before it gains traction. Otherwise, the artist is going to want even a bigger cut because those are individually negotiated. So they're going to want some sort of share of the royalties, which I which I agree with. By the way, I think the original artist should continue to get some sort of a resale royalty, if you will. Um, but the fact that it's a secondary license and that most people don't know they need to get it is, in my opinion, a bit problematic. Yeah, absolutely. And I would encourage you to check out the entirety of my interview with Cristelia if you're interested in legal issues. Although I can only apologize for the atrocious karaoke that is uh, happening in the background during the interview and that no amount of denoising managed to cancel. And finally, uh, I'd like to end with a short overview from uh, Butcher Lazochak from the Library of Congress on what they're doing on the audio preservation front, which is a really important issue for all of us working in the industry. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the Library of Congress, how audio preservation, uh, you know, how the program started. Uh, I think, you know, it probably has, it has its roots in the early 2000s. Uh, so how did, how did that come about and how did that program start? Great. Well, I'll talk, so there's a couple of things. So the Library of Congress um, actually has one of the largest music collections in the world, probably the largest music collection in the world uh, in terms of the quantity and, and, and the quality of things. Um, and so there are... The part of the library that I work in is the digital preservation part. And what we really do is uh, work with a network of partners outside the library to explore ways to preserve digital information of, of all different kinds. And music is certainly one of those kinds. Um, and so uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. But within the library, we have a, a campus uh, part of the library, which is out in Culpeper, Virginia. It's called the Packard Campus. And that is where we've moved all the music collections and movie collections of the library out there. Well, back in 2000, Congress of the United States um, was concerned that digital information was being created, but there was uh, no plan for how this information, you know, would be preserved over the long term. And the pro you know, the issues with digital information uh, are that the technology changes so rapidly that um, if if things aren't managed in a in a very coordinated way, this information can rapidly become, uh, you know, uh, not understandable anymore. Yeah. And so Congress recognized this as a, as a huge interest and uh, called on the library to explore this um, back in 2000. So we had a good bit of funding to do that. And you know, a big piece of uh, reading the, uh, the paper that was published uh, uh, recently. The National Recording Preservation Plan? Plan? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And, you know, one of the sentences that really struck me, you know, on the first few pages was the fact that, of course, we're all talking about preservation uh, and that's really important, especially on, on the audio front, because we know that there's such a nightmare in terms of formats and everything that needs to be taken into account. But also, of course, any effort of uh, archival and preservation of the audio has to be done with the long view of actually making that material accessible in some form to the public. And of course, with music, that's always problematic because of issues of very long copyrights that, that 
prevent that from from being particularly straightforward so so how do you guys deal with that part of it and and how how is the audio accessible uh, i guess um, after it's archived right well that is certainly one of the challenges that we have at the library in that um we are quite hesitant to make materials available that aren't free, copyright free. And, but we also have a very long view of things. So, um, yeah, sure. you know, we're collecting today for some user a hundred years in the future and the material we're collecting right now that's under copyright, at some point it'll be out of copyright and we can make those materials accessible. Yeah. Um, so, so the challenge for us making it accessible is that, so for example, we have, um, uh, we created a jukebox in, in, uh, uh, working with MCA, I believe it's MCA Records, um, that makes a lot of their early 20th century materials available uh, as part of a jukebox on the library's website. But all of that, most you know, that material is all out of copyright. Yeah. So you're not going to see um, contemporary materials being being made accessible on the web in the way that 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 maybe users would like. But. Um, and I would encourage you to check out the rest of the interview with Butch if you are at all interested in audio archival issues or music preservation issues. And with this overview, I am inclined to end the special episode of Digital Music Trends from South by Southwest 2013. I have a ton more to share with you in terms of interesting subject matters that were covered during the South by interviews, but it would make the show two hours long. So I can only encourage you to go to uh, my sound, SoundCloud channel, which is uh, soundcloud.com slash digital music trends, and my YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash digital music trends to find the South by Southwest interviews uh, in their entirety and check them out. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, from next week, the regular Digital Music Trends is going to be back on. So look out for that and for more news from the digital music industry. You can email me on andrea at digitalmusictrends.com uh, with any feedback or tweet at digimusictrends. Have a great week and till next time.